Not, none of the uh, normal drum roll, I'm uh, disappointed. So if you're ready, we'll uh, get started. Good morning, everyone. My name is Arthur Potts, and I'm the MPP for Beaches East York, and I also have the pleasure of serving as the Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change and the Minister of Transportation. Kind of an interesting dual role, and uh, we'll talk about that more. It relates very much to this announcement today. But before we start, I'm happy to bring greetings and to recognize that we are on traditional lands of many First Nations, most recently, recently the Mississauga of the New Credit, and we value very much our joint relationship with our First Nations partners. The subject of today's announcement relates directly to environment and transportation. And shortly, we'll be joined by Minister McCharles, who will have an opportunity to explain the announcement in more detail. But I want to set a little context for it first. As the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, we all, I, I know and we all know that the climate challenges that we have in this world are very important, very serious. Climate change is real and it creates tremendous, it creates tremendous difficulties for, for us in terms of flooding and, uh, and other extreme weather events. And it's something that needs to be addressed. It has threats. We've seen it. We've seen it with the flooding. But with every with the threat also comes opportunity. And in the province of Ontario, we've seized on the opportunities around climate change by getting off coal, for instance, but more importantly, creating an electricity grid that now, today, is running at about 97% carbon free. That's an incredible accomplishment, which creates huge opportunities in Ontario, opportunities in the clean tech sector, where we're employing so many companies who look for opportunities where they can come into Ontario because of our clean electricity grid, Ontario is a place where we can build out new technologies, new sustainable technologies, and like, for instance, using surplus electricity to create hydrogen in order to use that to displace transportation fuel. And so it's very important what we have brought in as a government, the cap and trade legislation, which puts a price on carbon. And I think it's worth mentioning that we brought in 4.3 cents on a litre of gasoline two and a half years ago, on nearly two and a half, two years ago, Gasoline prices were about 98 cents a litre. And now gasoline prices today coming down here, I noticed a dollar 38 in many stations. So our 4.3%, 4.3 cents on a litre is not what's driving the price of gasoline in the province. It's being driven by demand. What we see, even at a dollar 30, demand for gasoline has never been higher in North America. We've had record demand for gasoline so that even with the increase in pricing because of the elasticity of the demand, people are not reducing their carbon footprint, which is why cap and trade is so important because we were able, we have been able so far to raise $2.4 billion from the proceeds of cap and trade, which we can put directly into carbon saving technologies. And in Ontario, they come in a whole bunch of different forms, whether it's in buildings and transportation and it's an in infrastructure. Uh, and what we're here today to talk about is a transportation opportunity. We have deep discounts, deep subsidies that we're giving to people who buy electric vehicles or electric hybrid vehicles. $14,000, for instance, on a Chevy Volt in order to allow a family to encourage a family to be carbon free in their transportation. And what we have found are great challenges all across the province where people don't have access, for instance, to a garage, a charging space in order to take full advantage of electric vehicle charging stations. I know this in my community where people don't have garages, they park on the street, where are they supposed to put their charger? And we're working with the City of Toronto to see if we can't get special dispensation to allow people to park on their front lawns if they have electric vehicle to put a charging station there. We also see this, here we are in Han Dong's, MVP Han Dong's ward, which is a wash in condos. And trying to sort out how people in condos can have access to electric vehicle charging station is a real challenge. And so, well, that's what we're here to talk about, our new rules, and I invite Tracy McCharles, the MPP for Pickering Scarborough East, and the Minister of Government and Community Services, come up with this very important announcement that we've arranged with today. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks, Arthur. Thank you, Arthur. And I'm still asking the question, why is everyone so far back? Come on up. <laughs> come on in. <laughs> Well, this is a, a real deja vu, vu moment for me because I think it was about five years ago, many of us were in this very spot talking about some action we were taking to uh, protect consumers. It may have been the regulations for uh, uh, condo managers and uh, here we are five years later and so much has happened. And I want to th thank Arthur for the kind introduction and bringing some uh, perspective and context to why we're here today. 
And when the Protecting Condo Owners Act received royal assent in 2015, it did represent a very significant update to the laws regulating the condo sector in Ontario. The condo market in our province has changed dramatically over the last two decades. There are currently an estimated 10,000 condo corporations in Ontario and more than 680,000 Ontario households live in condo uh, condominiums. I don't know if we've exceeded the 1 in 10 mark, uh, but that's a lot of people in Ontario living in condos. And condos represent more than half of the new homes under construction in our province. This tremendous increase in the number of condos across the province comes with various challenges that need to be addressed on behalf of owners, residents, managers, boards, and many others. As many condos serve as residential dwellings, there's a growing interest by condo unit owners purchasing electric vehicles or EVs with the hope that they can charge those EVs at their home. In June 2016, the Government of Ontario released its Climate Change Action Plan and increasing the use of EVs is identified as a priority in the effort to reduce Ontario's carbon emissions. The Climate Change Action Plan includes recommendations to establish requirements for existing condos and apartment buildings to make it easier to install electric vehicle charging stations for residents. I'm here today to announce new laws that will facilitate the installation of EV charging systems on condominium properties effective May 1, 2018. Our government in support of the Climate Change Action Plan is introducing new laws that will first reduce current requirements relating to uh, the approval for condo owners when condo corps proceed with an EV charging system installation in a condominium, and two, prevent condo boards from rejecting an owner's request to install an EV charging system on condo property when the owner meets certain conditions. As you know, our government is leading the Condominium Act to uh, reform to improve condo living for Ontarians and it's established legislation regulating condo managers and management providers. Last year we created two new oversight bodies, the Condominium Authority of Ontario or CAO as we call it and the Condominium Management Regulatory Authority of Ontario, our other famous uh, acronym, acronym CMRAO. So the CAO is now in service to provide education and promote awareness of condo owner rights and responsibilities, as well as providing important information to condo corporations and providing low cost dispute resolution systems for certain condo disputes. And the CR, CMRAO is working to ensure stronger consumer protections for people living in condos in Ontario by regulating and licensing condo managers and management providers. These changes will mean that condo owners will be kept better informed about the running of their condominium community and will be given greater opportunity to have their voices heard. And condo directors will be given the tools to better carry out their roles and responsibilities through mandatory education. I'd like to take a moment to thank the leadership of the two administrative authorities, particularly CAO Chair Tom Wright. I saw him here earlier. Thank you, Tom, so much. And CMRAO Chair Aubrey, Aubrey LeBlanc is over there to my left. As a government, we're committed to helping build healthy and sustainable condo communities across our province. We want to provide greater confidence and security for condo owners in their investment and greater stability in their day-to-day -day lives and in their communities. Over the next year, we'll continue to phase in new laws to protect condo owners as we continue to address the growing needs of condo communities across the province. Condo owners have indicated to us they face significant challenges in seeking condo board approval, installing EV charging systems on condo premises, and frustration with the inability to obtain a condo board approval for installation. So we've heard these concerns and we've undertaken consultations on the best approach for facilitating the installation of EV charging systems in condominiums. 
We did this through a regulatory uh, registry posting. We received over 600 submissions and we also conducted in-person consultation with our key stakeholders. That feedback was used to develop the new laws and regulations that are taking effect on May 1st. I want to express my sincere appreciation to everyone who participated in the consultations and I want to thank my ministry officials, many are here today, uh, and for their hard work in getting us to this stage. Thank you very much. Hmm? And condo owners and boards. Yes, yeah. Arthur's reminding me. We have a number of condo owner and board people here today. Yeah. So thank you as well for being here and, and for your participation in the process. Building healthy and sustainable condo communities requires an approach based on collaboration. Through these new laws, we are seeking to increase opportunities to install EV charging systems at condo properties in order to support condo residents who own or wish to purchase an EV knowing there is an ability to charge their vehicle where they live. And isn't that sort of been the barrier thus far? That's what I think about when I come from Pickering to downtown Toronto. If I, if I came here in an electric vehicle, where would I charge the car? So for condo uh, owners, we want to make it easier uh, and for condo corps to have those charging systems installed at the, pro at the condo properties. We've committed to continually work collaboratively so that Ontario's condo market continues to grow and transform. We know it's a complex business, the condominium uh, sector, and we want to be well positioned to adapt and support vibrant and sustainable condo communities across our province. Through these new laws, we're supporting our government's effort and encouraging Ontario to purchase EVs and contributing to reduce carbon emissions. And as Arthur says, there are incentives to do so through the Ministry of Transportation. So whether you live in northern or southern Ontario, in a rural or a big city, Ontario's Climate Change Action Plan will help you reduce your emissions, use less energy and save you more money. The plan is helping people fight climate change at home and in their communities while also saving money through investments in home energy retrofits, public transit, electric vehicle incentives and social housing retrofits. Fighting climate change while supporting economic growth is part of our government's plan to create jobs, grow our economy and help people in their everyday lives. Again, I want to thank everyone for being here today and thank everyone who's participated in the process. It's uh, appreciated and uh, with that I'll end my remarks and happy to take questions. We also have staff who can help with any technical questions. Thank you, Mercy McGledge. Hello. Minister, what is the problem with installing electrical vehicle charging stations in Honda? Why, why do Honda boards object to them and what specifically are you changing in the rules to make sure they get built? So we are lowering uh, thresholds for board approval to install EV uh, uh, charging systems and for voting, for a board to, to vote. and. We are, of course, as I mentioned, there's incentives to purchase EV uh, charging systems, but we're giving condo condominium owners more rights. So you have different scenarios where an owner could initiate an EV station and work with the, uh, the owner to, to work out what those costs will be. Or you could have a situation, I'd like to think, where the condo itself, the owner will initiate uh, installation of of uh, the systems. In any case, I think at the core of it, what has to be uh, worked out are the costs. But there are new, uh, new rules that enable the owners of condos to bring forward their requests and to get that support with lower thresholds for board support. So, where's my Brad? Here's Brad, he'll go over the, the details of it. But I think at the core of it is working out who's gonna pay for what. This is Brad from the Ministry. Hi. Um, so in terms of, of uh, the approval process, so if a unit owner is seeking to get approval, they normally have to get that approval through their condo board and the condo board alone. Um, it, the past experience with a lot of unit owners is uh, condo boards, sometimes they don't understand that uh, application and so they defer it, they pass it along. 
So in this case, the unit owner under this process will have to put together a proposal, provide it to the condo board with the required specifications, and the condo board will have 60 days from receiving that proposal to decide um, uh, and assess it and determine that they wish to either uh, approve it or they may want to come back with uh, an, an, an amended proposal to be cognizant of the other unit owner's property. And with the two parties, once they come to an agreement about the, pr the proposal, th from the day that the board gets back to the unit owner uh, with its response, both parties will have 90 days to negotiate an agreement which will cover areas such as the cost of the maintenance, the insurance, the, and so on, as well as uh, the actual installation costs, which unless parties mutually agree otherwise, the unit owner, him or herself, will have to cover as part of that uh, installation and that agreement. What are those costs? It must be incredibly high if it's causing so much trouble. So costs can vary. It depends. Uh, condominiums, they are a thousand and one shapes and forms, so they can always kind of vary. But uh, in recent stakeholder consultations where we had EV providers, the range was anywhere from $2,000 to $10,000 per EV charger, all costs in, including your legal costs, including electric, electrician uh, fees and that sort of thing. So the, as going back to if a unit owner wants to install, uh, the, the um, regulation provides that unless the condo board and the owner agree otherwise, the unit owner would be obliged to pay for the actual installation, but all other costs related to, say for instance, the operation, ongoing electrical costs, the insurance, that will be something that the parties will negotiate together. Now, I think condo boards, they would understand that if a unit owner is coming to them and seeking to do the installation, they would understand that that unit owner is going to be very receptive to, to uh, accepting those costs as part of the agreement. Are there any breaks for the unit owners? Sorry? Are there any breaks for the unit owners if they want to proceed with that? If, you're, if you've bought a condo and you spent $10,000 to put a, a thing in, maybe you want to move in a year, it's a lot of money to spend on something that right. you might move That's on. That's a good question. So as part of the agreement between the condo unit owner and the condo corporation, they will have to uh, work on how the disposition of the EV charger, if the condo unit owner is, is leaving, how who owns it, and what will uh, be the uh, disposition of that um, equipment uh, when they cease and use it and the agreement terminates. Again, that is something mutually worked out between the, the owner and the uh, condo board. Oh, and I'm sorry, the subsidy, I think uh, perhaps it was mentioned early, uh, any um, EV owner who can show that they've um, received the rebate uh, for, the, for the purchase of their EV can get an additional $1,000 rebate on their EV charger. Does, Dennis, it, does it only apply if it's that particular unit owner's parking space? So let's say they don't have a parking space and they, need, they have an EV charge, they wanted to use an EV charge station. Is there a responsibility on behalf of the condominium corporation to provide a space for that unit owner who needs it? So it's been our experience that normally condo unit owners have assigned spaces, whether it's common elements or dedicated spaces. Um, that sounds like a very unique situation, but it's again, it's something that, that uh, as part of the application process, the unit owner could go forward to the condo board if that situation arose. But normally, they have an assigned space, and so they are going towards the, the uh, board with their proposal for seeking the, uh, the installation on that uh, space that assigned to them. There's nothing, there's nothing prohibiting from the condo board and the unit owner uh, de uh, f finding another space if they want to install the EV charger. I'm all here, come on. <laughs> Does this, this pertain to retrofitting as opposed to new condominiums that would be, would be built down the road would have this type of... Uh, right. So, that's a great question. Our, our regulation is essentially for retrofitting an existing space. Having said that, um, I, uh, my understanding is under the Ontario Building Code, new multi-residential um, buildings will have a requirement to install essentially rough-ins conduit uh, infrastructure to allow for the installation of EV um, charging equipment in a building. So once that building, uh, that multi-residential building is built and an EV owner is in there, 
they approach their condo board, they want to make that installation, and they have the added bonus that the infrastructure has already been put in place. Is there anything too that, um, could the condo corporation build this into just the, uh, the fees for overall people who live there? I think it's up to about 10% of what the, the, the fees would be. So, so that's a good point in terms of the, sometimes condo boards will want to initiate, they're progressive, they understand the demands for electrical uh, charging needs of their unit owners, so they, under our regulation, essentially um, a condo board can go forward with a project to install electric vehicle charging equipment uh, without requiring all the requisite approvals um, under the Condo Act, provided that the, the actual spend is no more than 10% of the common expense budget mm -hmm. and also that, uh, it, in the board's opinion, they feel that it, it would not unreasonably incur on people's unit owners' enjoyment of their units and their condo, condo common elements. Uh, EVs would be about 1% of all cars that are being sold. Is this going to substantially increase uh, the sales of EVs in your opinion? Oh, yes. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Of Ontario, for the first time, surpassed Quebec in the number of electric vehicles being sold. We are seeing a doubling of electric vehicles and hybrid electric vehicles almost every year right now. So at the moment, it is just over 1%, but it's going to be 2% next year, 4% the year after that. There's a huge uh, movement towards it, and the biggest barrier at the moment is supply. Uh, people want these cars, but they can't get them yet. So we're working with auto manufacturers to make sure we have a supply of electric vehicles to fulfill a, a fastly growing marketplace. And I know from friends of mine who live in condos who wanted to have EVs, you get down to this whole issue, your space is your space. And it may be expensive to put electric vehicle charging system to your space, but it would be cheaper to put it to another space. But someone else might have that space because preferential treatment to the elevator access. And so we have to work out those, and this will allow the board, my understanding, to uh, have more direct guidelines on how to sort these. And I think there's a very interesting parallel between how condo owners are dealing with handicapped spaces in their buildings. Accessible. Sorry, <laughs> my point, this is the Minister for <laughs> Accessibility. Accessible spaces in the condo, they've had to do, you know, be, be far more cognizant of the special needs associated with people in accessible space. And I think we're trying to create the same kind of mechanism here to allow people with electric vehicles, given the priority nature of getting people off fossil fuel and into electric vehicles. That may be a question, and then to negotiate between the owner and the condo board, and their sort of limited grounds on which the condo board can reject an application if it satisfies like those conditions. So I'm wondering what happens if the condo board and the owner can't come to an agreement on the costs. So. To preface the question, right now condo boards and unit owners do a lot of this negotiation. It's They're actually getting installations done. This, these regulations will facilitate where there's um, certain um, ambiguity. Having said that, if there is any um, dispute between a condo board and a unit owner over that process or are trying to finalize agreement, um, disputes would uh, be subject under the Condo Act provisions to meet uh, mandatory mediation and arbitration. No more questions? All right. Thank you. Oh. What, what is the government's role in uh, condo developers that are backing away from projects, leaving people who've had their money take, you know, in the pot for two years without a place to live now because they've been priced out of the real estate market? So consumer protections seem kind of scarce. Is the government concerned? Are you looking at ramping those up a little bit? So that, that story obviously has been in the media that's drawn attention to this kind of uh, question and it is the consumer protection legislation and uh, reforms to uh, the Tarrant Corporation that have allowed those purchasers to get their refunds back. Having said that, um, I recognize that uh, those, those consumers may have other concerns and I understand Tarrant has uh, uh, made themselves available to uh, engage on any issues on things like the uh, corporation owner conduct and things like that. But with changes in the market, are you concerned that the number of consumers left in this situation 
situation is, is increasing? So we have ongoing work to do on this file. It's, it's not finished. So from a regulatory point of view, these are the kinds of things that we're going to seriously look at as we can continue to evolve, evolve our regulations under, under the legislation. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brad.